Hello? Is that Frank? Yes. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, yeah. Glad to meet you. Well, glad to meet you, too, even if it's over the phone. I heard you paint houses. Yes, yes, sir, I, I do. I do, and I, uh, I also do my own carpentry. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I understand you're a brother of mine. Yes, sir, Local 107, since 1947. Yeah, you know, uh, our friend speaks very highly of you. Well, thank you. He's not an easy man to please. Well, I do my best. This is Kenneth Tran of the Los Angeles Times. I'm here with my colleague, Justin Chang, and we're here to talk about one of the longest and one of the most anticipated movies of the coming fall, Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. So a lot of anticipation, as I say. Justin, how did it strike you? I really liked this movie. I mean, it is all those things you say, Kenny. It is three and a half hours long. Martin Scorsese is known for making long movies, and here I think he pushes, he and his wonderful editor, Thelma Schoenmacher, uh, you know, push that even further. But um, I think it's, it's him reckoning with his cinematic legacy as our great exponent of, of, of New York crime sagas. And this is that and telling the story of, of Frank Sheeran and Jimmy Hoffa, um, working with actors that he's worked with before, Robert De Niro and, um, and Joe Pesci, among, among many. And, uh, but there's this, this elegiac tone to it that I think is so powerful, I found, really powerful and sustaining despite the length. I didn't, you know, sometimes we fixate, I think, a lot on how long the movie is, but this movie, you know, it doesn't exactly fly by, but I was pretty riveted, especially in the final hour, I would say. <laughs> a final hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you think? Yeah, no, no, yeah. it's, uh, I would, you know, I think one reason we're doing this, and we really, we only do this when there's these movies. A movie that have, warrants it. Yeah, a movie that warrants it, that we only get together and share our views publicly when a movie warrants it. Yeah, I was very impressed by it, and I have not always yeah. been enamored of every single minute of every single gangland uh, extravaganza that has come out. Uh, but this one feels different to me, as you say. This one has a little bit of a different tone to it. I wasn't expecting it. You know, and I think, again, as you say, it's elegiac, and I think, you know, Scorsese is getting to a certain age, and I think when you get to this age, you start, you know, we've seen a lot of filmmakers actually this time, Absolutely. you know, this, this year doing things like this. I mean, Quentin Tarantino has a little bit of an elegiac feeling to it. Uh, Pain and Glory, the Amadovar film has a little bit of that. I mean, we're really kind of hitting this kind of critical mass of filmmakers who are thinking, so to speak, critical mass. Uh, stealing your thunder, Justin. No, no. no. <laughs> the puns should be yours. It's a, it's a good one. No, more uh, the merrier. Uh, um, it's true. Yeah. I, I think these are movie. These are filmmakers who are in a very ruminative mood. Um, it's interesting too because, you know, when Tarantino first came on, a lot of people thought he was sort of a Scorsese wannabe, and so it's very it's very moving to see mm. directors who are approaching their subjects uh, with this uh, in this state of mind. Um, you know, you think about Goodfellas, and you even think about the way there are tracking shots in The Irishman, including the one that opens the film, where you come upon De Niro's character, Frank Sheeran, in a, in a retirement home. And it's, a com it's completely the opposite of effect of that famous shot in, in, in Goodfellas, where, um, where it, you're, you feel like, you know, just alive, and it's, there's this ecstatic energy in that movie. And I think throughout the movie, he is sort of, not, not, issuing like a corrective in some ways, but in some ways um, countering um, what he did in movies like Goodfellas where you, mm -hmm. you sort of get high on a movie. This is, this is like a, I don't wanna say like a downer in the sense like it's a no, bum, no. bummer, but it's, it's, it slows you down and you know, Joe Pesci who's so ferocious in Goodfellas is mm -hmm. so restrained here. And mm -hmm. Joe Pesci hasn't made a movie in, in so long mm -hmm. and it's wonderful to see him on the screen again. Yeah, I mean it's interesting that really even though on some level I mean, I think this is, even though everything you say is completely accurate, it, it doesn't have that kind of surface excitement. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's extraordinarily involving. I think I was more involved in it, even its slowness and its ruminative meditative qualities drew me in more. Sometimes that manic excitement of the earlier films pushed me away. And this one very much drew me in. It's interesting too, you know, a lot of the story about the movie has been, you know, Netflix was the only 
outfit that would give Scorsese mm -hmm. the money to do the the digital de aging. You know, because yeah. this movie spans uh, decades, and so you know, De Niro is is de aged, and 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 you know, it's and it looks pretty good, I think. You know. Um, but so it's it's a real it's going to be a test of Scorsese's legacy. It's going to be a test of mm -hmm. a lot of things because they're giving it some limited theatrical play, maybe a bit more than they would normally for um, a Netflix movie. But then, of course, most people are going to see this in their living rooms, and and they're competing for Oscars too, of course. So yeah, I mean, I think there's something in some way. There's something again because maybe because it is a meditative movie, but no. there's something very sad that this movie is going to live most of its life on Netflix. I mean, you know, Scorsese's entire career has been on the big screen for decades, and this is so much a big screen movie. I think, you know, even though everyone talked about Roma, I mean, I really believe this would be worse served by yeah. being on a small screen than Roma. And is something really, you know, sad, changing of the guardish about the fact that this is going to live its life on the smaller screen, and it will have a very finite window yeah. to catch it where it belongs. Well, and, and given what a champion of the theatrical big screen viewing experience Scorsese is, yeah. it's, it is interesting and maybe a little disheartening, but he did what he, I suppose he felt he had to do to no get the movie No one else, made. you know, I think he made the right decision. No one else would make this movie. And you have to, your hat has to go off to Netflix. They financed this movie. It was expensive. It was not a sure thing. It wasn't like, oh, of course, this is going to turn out well. It could have been a huge turkey, you know, right? Close to Thanksgiving release, you know? <laughs> exactly. But it wasn't, you know? And I think, you know, I have an admiration for Netflix for putting their Absolutely. money where their mouth is, but I guess you can't have it always. Well, it's a terrific movie, I think, and however you see it, I hope you will see it and read more of our movie coverage at latimes.com.